We'd like to welcome you to our presentation today, Creating Engaging and Accessible Learning Experiences Through Google Slides. My name is Sandy Champis. I am a speech therapist, and this is my colleague, Ellen Deutsch, who is a special education teacher. We are both assistive technology consultants at the LaGrange Area Department of Special Education, also known as LADSI, and we've been working together forever. We have two goals for you. At the end of this presentation, we'd like you to walk away with knowledge on how to make engaging activities. So we provided you with a handout containing videos and print tutorials of things you can do to spruce up your slides. We will also demonstrate some of these tricks of the trade throughout this presentation. The second thing we want you to walk away with is a bunch of activities and templates that you can use today. So we have gathered activities and categorized them for you to download. Some of these you can use as is and some you will need to edit. Obviously pictures are great additions to Google Slides. And in this activity, students are presented with pictures and asked to describe them or talk about them. And what we've done is added a couple slides that have symbols. So you could say to the student, which color do you want to talk about? And they say, hmm, and you're like red or blue. And they're like red. And you say, great. How many red cupcake liners do you see? And they say two. And you say, yes. And then you're like, let's create the sentence. And so you can just copy all four of these and then go back to your slide and paste it in. And now you can practice reading with the student or you can print this out and the student can take it home and the parent can see what the student quote unquote wrote about. Probably wondering where did they find those symbols? Well, Saltillo has given us all a wonderful gift. They created a website with PDFs of all of their touch chat word power Boards. So if you click on touch chat symbols right here, you will see a bunch of symbols. And then what you need to do is take a screenshot of the symbol. So if you click here where it says screenshot, it will give you the um, keys that you need to press on your device in order to take a screenshot. So I am on a Mac computer. So on my keyboard, I'm going to touch command shift and the number four, and you see you get these crosshairs. And what I do is I just take a, draw a square around the picture that I want, the symbol. It appears right here, and I can just click and drag it to my presentation. Um, I can make it bigger or smaller. I can also double click. And now with that black square around it, as long as I'm on one of the corners, I can crop it a little bit too, which is a nice feature as well. And you see here that what we did is we added symbols to the book, My Truck is Stuck. And our purpose was that when the teacher is reading the book, especially if it's an online activity or if you're projecting it onto a big screen so the students can see the book really well, um, you could choose to either read the words that are in the story, or you could use it as a language activity and say, oh, look, truck, go, go truck. Or you could use it to ask them questions. What did the truck do? And they can say go or point to go. Okay. So um, if doing online therapy has taught me anything, it's that children love the fun factor. Making therapy fun is much easier in person. However, making items magically appear can be very entertaining. So here is an example of um, something hiding behind the balloons. So watch, you say to the student, oh my goodness, there's something behind the balloons. What do you think it is? Do you think we should pop those balloons? And hopefully they're not afraid of balloons and they say yes. So you click, the balloon pops, the picture disappears, and then there's a picture of a family eating salmon. Um, and the purpose of that would be so you could discuss with the student um, about the picture. Not in a speech path, I can't help it. 
Okay, so how did I do that? Well, if I move the square, you're going to see that there is a picture. So what I did is I went to insert. Oops, I'm sorry, I did not do that. I'm ahead of myself. I went to background, clicked on that, clicked on choose image, and then I did a Google image search for a family eating salmon. And then I clicked done. And then I came up here to shapes, did shape and chose a square. And I drew my square on the page and then I colored it blue. So then I just made sure that my square covered up the people. I also inserted the picture of the monkey and the thumbtack and I used animation to make them disappear. Okay, so um, animation is another great feature that can make your slides more engaging and a whole lot of fun. So you can do it one of two ways. One is to animate prior to the activities, like you saw the monkey disappear. Um, but you can also animate during the activity. And I don't think this is being lazy. I think it's a great way to have your student um, direct the activity. So you can say, oh, look at this cub. Should he um, run or should he spin? And should he go fast or should he go slow? And it really just takes a couple of seconds to add that animation and the kids really do love it. So let's take a quick second and look at this video of how to do it. Say, well, would you like to make him run? And we do that by making sure he's highlighted click on animate and right here where it says fade in, you go to fly out to the left since he's positioned on the right. Do you want him to go fast or slow? Even if they say fast, you still have to move it down around medium. And then you hit present. And now when you click, the lion will run. Okay, he also disappears a little bit, but that doesn't seem to bother anybody. Now, if you noticed the um, lion or cub or whatever that was, he um, was moving, right? Even before I animated him. And that's because he was a GIF. Alan and I love, love, love GIFs. And basically what they are, are pictures that that move, okay? They're like little video pictures. And um, it's very easy to insert a GIF into your presentation. You go to giphy.com, you type in the search box what you're looking for, you click on your desired GIF, and then there's a little like chain link that comes up. And what you do, let's do this really, really quick. Let's pretend that I did that, that I already went to Giphy and got my, my GIF. And then I go to, in my slides, insert image, whoa, the image, um, but I come down here and go by URL. And then I just paste it in and oops, there he is, click insert. And now I am craving Lucky Charms. There you go. And so you can resize it. Um, I also like that if you double click, you can also crop it because sometimes um, you might not want a certain part of the GIF. Okay. All right. Um, so here's how it could be used in a, um, a presentation. You know, the lion is running and then you click, he is, oops, he's fast. Okay. Um, so you have access to that presentation with GIFs already in it. Okay, the next slide is our most favorite slide ever because look at this dog. He is so cute how he just pops into the presentation. Um, so what he is, is a sticker. Giphy.com also has um, a bunch of GIFs that have no background. Um, so there are lots of fun to use. You can use them um, like ornaments to decorate a Christmas tree or a house. Um, and all you do is you know, click on stickers on Giphy.com and then click on the little chain link and then click on insert um, image by URL. And then we come here and there we go. Some more lucky charms. Um, but you see, again, you can then just position him wherever you want. So he fits pretty well in the, in the box too. Okay. All right. So um, some 
sometimes you might be like, those are way overstimulating, Sandy, and I'm, I'm not going to use those GIFs. And that's totally fine. Um, but if you choose to use images, you'll find that a lot of them come with a background, right? And like Olaf here, we can't put him in the pool in his normal uh, mode because there's snow behind them. So what we have to do is go to this website, removebg.com and remove the background. So here's a I quick tutorial. By typing the name of the picture that I'm looking for. I click on images. I click on tools, usage rights, creative common licenses. And I click on the picture that I like. And now I click on another tab and type in remove BG click on the website. And then I like to click and hold on the tab and drag it out so that the tabs are side by side. I click on the picture of my dog and drop it. And the background is removed. I click on download. And there's my dog. And now I come back to the activity that I want my dog to appear in and I just click and hold and drag him and there is our dog. Okay, easy peasy. I begin by Oopsie. typing the name of the- There we go. All right, Miss Ellen. So I haven't seen any questions come up yet, but if you have a question, you can please drop it in the chat. Um, we are covering a lot of content very quickly today, um, and but we will try and circle around and answer questions. Um, so, Going to turn the chat over to Sandy and um, I'm going to start with some audio. So we love adding audio to our slides to increase interest and engagement as well as accessibility. Um, unfortunately, currently Google Slides allows you to insert audio only from your drive and you can't record directly into your slides, but we have some ways around that. Um, so one of the tools that we love is the online voice recorder. It's super easy and you do not need to ask your tech department to install an extension. So let's take a look at a little video about that. Sandy, do you want to advance? Thank you. It's looking at the chat. <laughs> I can't do two things at once. So to begin with, go to onlinevoicerecorder.com, press the red record button, and say your piece and five little pumpkins rolled out of sight. You can even drag the ends to get rid of that blank space before and after you talk and saving it will download it to your computer. Before you can bring it into your slides, you need to go to your Google Slides, Google Drive, excuse me, press new and upload your file. Once it's uploaded, you can go into your slides, go to insert audio, find your recording, select it. And once it comes in, you can move it around and you can resize it. And then you can choose the format options to play on click, which is nice if you want students to be able to hear it over and over again, they'll be able to see the icon and, and play it again. Or if you do automatically, it will start up when the slide um, shows. And you can also choose to hide your icon when presenting. So if you don't want the icon there, you can do that. And that's all there is to it. Enjoy. OK, I, we did have a quick question if touch chat is available in Spanish. Um, it is available in Spanish, but I don't believe they have the low tech boards in Spanish, if that makes sense. I believe they had one set that was in Spanish. Okay, there you go. So to begin with, go to onlinevoicerecorder.com, press that. the red record. And then um, we had a question about, we'll be talking about using them through Zoom in a breakout room. Um, unfortunately, because we both work with students in small groups or individually, we don't have as much experience with, uh, with breakout rooms. Um, so, um, but you could certainly um, use them in a breakout room. Okay. All right, so um, this next one is a very new tool and we are so excited about it. Um, the mode extension is kind of a game changer because you can record directly within your Google Slides. So because it's so new, you get to listen to someone else's voice besides ours. And we're gonna show a little quick video on that. 
In this episode of Moat Minutes, we're really excited to introduce you to Moat for Google Slides. With the latest version of our extension installed, you'll notice that the Moat icon appears just above the slide deck that you're working on. Tapping once on this button will activate a pop-up window from which you can start to record your voice note. Once finished, you can play the audio back for review, rewind it, or even delete it if you'd like to start again. When you're happy with how it sounds, just click on the insert button and Moat will do all of the hard work for you. Within seconds, your audio file will appear on the slide that you're working on. When it's in, you can resize, move, and even change the way that it offers playback in presentation mode. If you decide to share the file with anyone else to edit, view, or present, the voice note will also be instantly accessible to them. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really hope that you enjoy Moat for Slides. Please don't forget to subscribe. And until next time, keep moating. I just want to interrupt and say, I love this so much. <laughs> and because it's a little dot that appears and you can resize it, you can put it on like a blender and then the kid could turn on the blender, you know, or mix master or whatever. And it's really fun. I love it. In this episode of Moat Minutes, we're really harder to to advance the slides through remote control. And um, so um, Moat, actually, I really love using it in this template. It makes it much easier now for our students to record responses because they don't have to go out to an outside um, website to do that. Um, so um, this template actually comes from Trisha Rafi, one of the um, wonderful, wonderful um, technology specialist who does the Google for Littles um, series. Um, and with it, the students just take a picture of the book they're reading and then record themselves reading a little bit for a fluency measure. And you just keep adding pages as you go through the year and you have a nice portfolio of their reading fluency. So I have taken her template and um, made a copy and added directions also for recording within the iPad because within the Google Slides app for iOS, um, audio definitely works different. So I have instructions for how to do that in there. And it could be also used where the teacher reads the book um, as well on the slide. Yeah, just not maybe in this template. <laughs> All right, so um, audio visuals can also take our flashcards to the next level. Um, so um, for example, in this one, I've got some um, basic sound cards for phonics instruction that have some added audio and visuals that go through it. Um, one of the problems though with doing um, flashcards in Google Slides is, you know, Google Slides advances in the same order all the time, right? So you get um, students who just memorize them in order. So there is a wonderful little extension again um, called Slide Randomizer and we'll take a look at that here. Take your flashcards to the next level by adding them to Google Slides. You can have st students study on their own and mark them correct using a sticker or a star of your choice, or you can use them in small group or whole group learning instruction. But one of the issues with Google Slides is that your slides will always pre be presented in the order that you have them in. So there is this nifty little add-on for Google called Slides Randomizer. So you're gonna to get to it from your add-ons menu. You're gonna choose Slides Randomizer. The first time you use it, it's going to ask you to start. After that, when you come back to add-ons and Slide Randomizer, you get this little menu. I'm gonna choose Randomize Presentation. It's gonna cue me, do I want to keep the slide one as a title slide? And I'm gonna say yes. And, And you're going to say okay and now i can come and present this j jag j and you can see they are no longer in alphabetical okay Take your flashcards to the next level by adding them to Google. <laughs> so Sandy found this great resource from Candy Tech Ideas um, that is so much fun. It's um, a series of soundboards for teachers. 
And um, these can't be edited, but if you pull these up during a session with students, whether you're doing um, small group instruction or, or a game with students, um, you can select different sounds for them to play or the students can select sounds from them and they are so much fun. There's even a soundboard that is Mario Kart options. Um, in one of the teacher ones, there's this particular sound. So I'll just play it and you can see what these sound like. So it's just the little twinkle sound there. Um, but it's just something that's fun to pull up and have as an option to really kind of help engage students and motivate them. All right, so for the rest of our slides, um, there are activities that demand that the students interact with them in edit mode rather than present mode. And you've kind of seen us go back and forth today between presenting and edit mode. Um, sometimes this can be a little too visually overwhelming. Um, so there's a couple of options. One is just going to full screen from the view menu within Google Slides. Um, so you're not presenting in present mode to students. Um, they can see the film strip on the side and your Chrome tabs, but it's gonna take off the um, top um, Google Slides menus um, to make it a little simpler. And then there's a free extension called Full Screen Interactive for Google, which removes the film strip and the Chrome tabs, but you can still have students write on the slides or drag and drop things on the slide. Uh, um, once in a while it does hang up and you have to um, reload your slides. So we're not um, doing that today, just in case that happened, but we'll show you a quick little video on that. You've downloaded the extension. Come up here to the little puzzle piece and click on the little push pin next to full screen interactive. And now you will see that the icon appears at the top of the screen. So all I have to do is click on that. You notice the little film strip went away and it looks like it's in presentation mode or full screen, but um, it is still in interactive mode. So I can drag my check mark there. I can click here and then just hit the down arrow on my computer and then I can start dragging my other things. So um, this is a way that students can use interactive slides without having the distraction of the side panel. And when you're done, just click escape. Once you've downloaded the extension. <laughs> okay, so um, with a lot of the drag and drop activities, um, you may first want to lock everything down, um, especially with the little ones who are still developing um, you know, some skill dragging and dropping things and using um, the mouse or the trackpad if, if they're on a Chromebook or a laptop. Um, so we're going to show you some ways that you can lock things down so that objects don't get moved um, by accident. So the first thing you want to do is just come and set up your slide. So in this case, for, um, for my potato head activity, I've got the background set and then you can see I've added, oops, back. I've added the shelves and um, and Mr. Potato Head in here with all his facial features um, because I don't want them to move. And then I'm going to add in later on all the clothing options and that's what they're going to drag over. So what I need to do then once this is done is I can come to file and download as a PNG image and then bring that image into a slide as the background. So when you look here, you can see I can't move um, this anything on the side of the screen. The only thing that can be moved are the pieces. So now I can have the slides uh, and work with them with a student. And in this case, it was for following directions. So move the crown onto Mr. Potato Head's head, you know, so I can come and then the students can move the, the crown. And even if they're not great at dragging and dropping things, they aren't going to move the ears and the eyes by accident. All right, so you may be thinking this is a lot of work and sometimes it is. Um, so um, when I'm putting a lot of work into things, I often like to just come up with something that the students are going to be engaged with over and over and over again. So virtual work mats are a great way, great way to do that. Um, Often we do that for math maths or for word building. Um, so I've got a couple of examples here. 
Um, but it's very simple. You set up a couple of, you set up your workspace. So let's take a look here. You can see I've got in the math one, I've got the different columns for hundreds, tens, and ones. And um, in the word building, there's a whiteboard for the students to start building words on. And then there's also a slide that has all of your manipulatives on it. Um, so this is kind of just a, a bank for your letters in this case. Um, and you're going to come and just copy and paste the letters that you wanna work with into your workspace. Now, sometimes you want to work with more than one letter at a time. So let's say you're doing a word family um, like the at family. So if I take and put the A and the T together for the, for the at family, I can select both letters and then go up to the arrange menu and choose group. And now I can copy and paste them together and I can move them together. So that's one way to do that. So word banks are, are, are really nice, the, the manipulatives for math mats, because you make them and then you can use them over and over and over again in instructional activities. Okay, so we're going to use this piggy bank math activity um, to show you a couple of other things. Um, so one is um, dice. So there are a couple of extensions for dice um, that Sandy will talk about with gameplay. Um, but often one of the easiest ways to do this is just to do a YouTube search for a dice video. Um, and then you don't have to have IT install anything for you. Um, but to play the dice, you just click on the video to start it. Sandy, I won't start for me. Do you want to roll it? Easier said than done. Let's see. I think it's um, because we're in edit mode. Sometimes yeah, it doesn't. Oh, you should still be able to, but do you want to try it or put it in? Uh, no, I'm, I'm trying it. Yeah, let me try present mode real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Oh, no. there you go. <laughs> I'm not sure. Nope. Go back to edit mode. It's being glitchy. It's being it, it, it should fly. Yeah. Anyways, you roll it, then you click it again to stop it. And in this case, it has a four. So if I went to um, to move a penny over, there's one, but look, there's more behind it. So how do you do that and have this endless stack of manipulatives? Well, the first thing you wanna do is just bring in one image. In this case, it's a coin. And then you can copy it and paste it as many times as you need. And then I'm just going to select all of them by dragging a big rectangle around all of them. And then if you go to the arrange menu and you're going to choose align and center and then back up align and middle. And now it just looks like one, but it's a whole stack of them. You can even move them together as long as they're still selected. So another thing um, you might sometimes want to do is have that illusion that something is going behind or inside another object, especially if you're working on prepositions, for example, or in this one, I want to put coins inside the bank. So to do that, bring all of your images onto your slide first, and then the image that you want in front, like it might be a basket, it might be in this case, um, the piggy bank, select that and then go back up to that same arrange menu and you're gonna choose order and bring to front. And what that's going to do is then as the students move all the pennies in, when they move them over, they're gonna disappear inside instead of appearing on top. Okay, I, I love the whole stacking thing. And um, you see in this presentation, um, all of my Lucky Charm marshmallows, the best part of Lucky Charms is um, they are stacked on top of each other. Now, the other thing that we did though, is that we inserted a table and that way the teacher can come and just put um, how many marshmallows she wants the student to drag into the bowl. So she says, okay, go ahead, put your marshmallows in and the student puts the marshmallows in the bowl. Let's pretend I did it right. And then um, she says, okay, should we put some milk in the bowl? And the kid, of course, says, well, hopefully they say yes. I don't know. These would be really good without milk. But if they say yes, you click your button. And this is some animation that happened where the bowl fills with milk. All right. Looks like magic, but was pretty easy to do. So let's look really quick at how we 
added the table and then how we made the magic appear as well. Oopsie. There we go. We started by making a table. So we do insert table, draw our table, and then we can change the border thickness. We can come up here and center the text and even change the size of the font. So the teacher clicks and there it appears. We also animated things. So if I drag this bowl to the side, you see that we have um, a bowl that's empty and we have a circle that's filled with milk and um, we have a background that's just a bowl. So what I did is I inserted this bowl here and then I took a screenshot of this whole page so that we could get a page with just this bowl in it. And then I went to background and did choose image and I inserted that image. The other thing that I did was animate it. So this is how the magic appears. Here's the empty bowl. And if I click on animate, you're going to see what happens. So first the milk spins, then after the milk spins, the bowl disappears. This bowl right here disappears, okay? And then notice it disappears after the previous. That means as soon as the milk spins, this bowl disappears, make it go. And then this milk fades in. Okay, so this is sitting here on top of the bowl and that fades in. Okay, we had um, a couple questions come up and one was, can you do we, these activities in Spanish? And yes, I think that if you would just um, type obviously in Spanish or what's awesome is having these, um, the ability to put your own voice in as well. And then somebody asked about inserting videos into slides, which we're gonna well, talk about. second, Sandy, um, for the language, if you go in Google to file, um, you'll see language on there and you can select the language that you want. Um, I would do that for you, except for I don't know Spanish well enough to be able to get my way back out of it. So <laughs> um, there are some options within Google for changing your language. Okay, so that's within Google, not within the Google Slides? Within Google Slides or Google Docs, any of them, yep. Okay, all right. And then how do you insert a video? Um, it's in the insert menu and you choose video and then you have a few options. One is by link. So when Sandy did the, um, the gifts, she copied the link for them. Um, one is by just looking it up in URL and one is by um, getting it out of your Google Drive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the URLs actually you insert as an image um, rather than a, than a video. Okay, writing okay. magnetic poetry. Okay. So I love magnetic poetry. I think it's a great way to do some um, writing with students, um, especially students who may struggle with um, with writing each letter, it gives them the option to do some whole word writing. And in this particular example, um, I'm bringing in sight words as well as vocabulary words that have some images in them. Um, and let's see. So let's take a look at how um, we bring in and make those tiles. So in this example, I have a page that has word tiles and a page that also has picture tiles. I'm going to show you how to make both. So I'm just going to come up here and I'm going to add a tile and all it really is is a rectangular shape. I'm going to make my shape and I'm going to choose my fill. In this case, I want it to be white. To really make it look like a tile, if you go to the three dots at the end and choose format options, check drop shadow. And you notice now it looks like it's set apart from the slide a little bit. Then you can just type your word on it. Change your font size if you want, and you're ready to go. You can even change and adjust the size. So that's your word tile. Now, what if you wanted to add an image to it? So you can obviously go do a Google search, but if you have access to read and write for Google Chrome, 
you can open it. That's the purple puzzle piece. And I'm going to go ahead first, and I am going to choose to have my word at the top so that when students are touching the pictures that they don't block the word. And then with my cursor right up there underneath rabbit, I'm going to go to the picture dictionary, choose picture, and I can actually drag it right over on top of that. You could resize it if you want a smaller picture. And then select both the picture and the tile and choose arrange and group. And now when students move the tile, the pictures and the words will move together. Okay, so obviously, you know, I'm a teacher. I went to a tool that I use all the time, which is Read and Write for Google. And Sandy, as a speech path, goes back to those communication symbols through, um, through um, what was it? <laughs> um, you know, obviously you could use BoardMaker. You could do just do a, a, a Google search for an image. Um, there's another icon um, bank that's out there that's called the Noun Project. Um, it's just the nounproject.com, I believe. Um, we've got it linked on one of these slides. Uh, but it's a great resource for some royalty-free icons as well, if you're looking for images. All right, so any questions right now? Are we still good, Sandy? Um, there is one more in the chat. Let me get it opened up really quick. Oh, how do we get the red circle around the cursor? Ellen, we are uh, using, go ahead. So um, I did my videos with um, Screencastify. I don't know if you've found that um, extension yet. Um, we needed to cut some things out of this presentation because we were going really long in practice. Um, today we're speaking really fast, apparently, because we're apparently. doing for time. <laughs> but um, if you haven't found Screencastify, check it out. It lets you do um, up to five minute videos for free without having um, more of a paid subscription. Um, and they are saved right into your Google Drive. They're really easy to share then that way. So I love using those. Um, and that's where that um, circle, um, red circle cursor came from, is it just built into Screencastify. Yeah, we should also mention that there are extensions that you can download that can change the size of your cursor and it can also change your cursor into like a pencil and eraser or SpongeBob. Um, so you can you can easily just Google, you know, fun cursors and you'll you'll find it. Yep. So as a teacher, I also like to um, get students doing some journaling um, or creating portfolios or personal dictionaries. So I've got a couple of examples here. Um, one is just a word of the day where the students have the word, they put their definition in, and then they write a sentence about it and have the image. And another one is a little simpler. It just has the word, a picture of it, and then an audio recording of um, the word so they can hear the pronunciation. But in, in both of these cases, as well as, you know, more of your more typical journals, um, it's helpful if the students, when they come in every day, you know, or every week to create a new one, but when they create a new slide, they can just choose that as a layout. So you're going to do that by editing the slide master, and it sounds more complicated than it really is. So I'll come down and show this to you. And again, we have links to all these videos in that first page as well. If you want a simple, um, a simple way to get back to all the videos, it's back at one of those initial slides. Um, and they're all, all the videos are one or two minutes long and there's a print tutorial too for most of them. So if you prefer print directions over a video that should be um, there as well. So let's take a look at this video. Create your own layout so that when students go to create a new slide, they can use a little drop down arrow and choose your slides as the layout. So let's go through how to do this. You're going to go to slide and edit master. And in here, you can even delete any of these that you think you do not need so that there's less options for the student to choose from. 
and then come find a slide that you want to adapt. Bring in your background. I've already downloaded the background that I want. And then once it comes in, you can add text boxes. And notice you have some choices to make it a title placeholder, subtitle, or body text. I'm just going to use um, a subtitle for the word of the day. That'll make it a little bit bigger font. And then for the others, I'm going to do a body placeholder. One in for definition. And you don't need to worry about the different levels. I'm going to do one for sentence here. And then it's automatically saved. So if I come out of here and my student has entered their words and they want to create a new one, they can go to plus sign and they have some options here and they can go ahead and choose your layout. So that really is a nice way um, to have students um, create new slides that have the background that you want and you know that it's not going to be written over um, in any way and they can continue to come back and get a copy of it. Um, so it's it's it just takes a few minutes to set it up and if it's something you're going to use quite often with students it's definitely worth it. All right, so interactive worksheets. You know, um, we all still love worksheets. It's a great way to get material to students and to see what they know. Um, you can actually bring them into Google Slides. So um, you can use the same technique that we did for adding a layout and, and actually put your, your worksheet or your graphic organizer in the slide master or um, you can just take a picture of it and add it as your background to work on. Um, so in this case, with these two, I've set it up as um, a background image. Um, you know, most of our worksheets are set up as a piece of paper originally, right? They're paper, so they're eight and a half by 11, and um, they're as PDFs. So those are two things that we um, can actually change in Google Slides. So we're going to change the size of our slide because we're not restricted in slides um, by having the standard um, size that they use for presentations. You can change it to a bigger workspace. So if you look at the back at the work mats, you'll see that those are a much bigger workspace. You can use the, um, the space beside your slides and put manipulatives or words that you want students to drag on um, over in the empty space as well. Um, so we're going to take a look at, at how to do that. Most print worksheets are the size of a piece of paper. So if you want to make a digital worksheet, it helps if you resize your slides first. So I'm going to go to file and all the way down to page setup. And I'm going to click where it says widescreen and choose custom and make that eight and a half by 10. <laughs> I had a mind break there. <laughs> now it's the size of a piece of paper. And then to bring in my worksheet, a lot of our worksheets are in PDF format and we need them to be in a image format. So I like to use this tool called um, Cloud Convert. I'm just going to sign in um, through my Google account and then I can search on Google. If you don't want to do that that way, you can go ahead and just copy your URL um, from your Google Drive and then paste that here. But I'm going to come to Google Drive. I'm going to grab my worksheet as a PDF file and say select. And I'm going to save it back to my Google Drive and then say convert. And now it's finished. So if you look in my Google Drive now in this folder, I now have a PNG or image version of the worksheet. So now I can go back to my Google Slides that I'm making and change the background.
seconds in my Google Drive. It's too recent. And insert. And there's my worksheet. You know, I can either have the students create their own text boxes, or I can go ahead and place them on here. If you want to, you can go through the extra step like we did um, a little bit earlier and create your own layout using the worksheet as a background. But this is a little bit faster. The other thing you can do is for students who are not writers, instead of leaving your worksheet as a typing blank, you can go ahead and create word tiles or even symbols for students to move up. And then all the students have to do is come and move them Oops. into place. That's really helpful for maps. I know you guys um, have more of the little kids, but um, we have so many students that really struggle with labeling maps and having those words that they can just drag over onto the top is really helpful. We did have a couple of questions. Um, someone asked uh, about receiving a copy of this presentation. So we did add it again to the chat box. So you Actually, should be able I may have added that privately. We may have to add it publicly. <laughs> I, I just did. And uh, someone asked about this recording. I believe it will be up on the DuPage ROE website. Um, and then the other question was, and this I'm going to defer to you, Ellen, um, can the activity, these activities be put into Seesaw and this, the students still be able to use it kind of in that edit mode with moving things around? Um, yes, as long as you don't have them view only. Uh, so when you set up your sharing um, settings with the students, it has to be in edit mode. I know Google Classroom makes this easy because they um, automatically, you, when you set, when you share an assignment through Classroom, it makes a copy. I'm not sure if Seesaw does that for you, but a little bit farther on, we're going to show you how to kind of force a copy. Um, but um, yeah, you, you would just have to have the, the, um, the slides unlocked so students can um, edit them. Okay. Most print worksheets are the size. I'm trying to get out of this and for some reason I'm having an issue. Do you want to just reload? Because I, I can do it either. I think we're kind of hung up. There we are. Okay. okay. I got it. Okay. All right. So we've talked a lot about using pictures. Now let's pivot to videos. Um, as we know, YouTube videos tend to be long. And let's face it, for a five-year-old, even a five-minute video is long. So a great feature in Google Slides is one that allows you to set the start and stop time of each video. So let's watch a video of how to make that happen. When using video as instruction, it's helpful to break it up over multiple slides so that you can build in opportunities for discussion and comprehension questions. So for example, in this one here, I have a video and if I click on it, you can see over the side in format options. And if it's not available, choose it from your toolbar here and look at video playback and you can see start time and end time. And I have changed the end time to 43 seconds then I have an opportunity to fill out a graphic organizer. And then a little bit farther along, I've got the next one. And you can see this begins at 43 seconds where the last one ended off and goes a little farther. So if we wanted to do our own, let's go ahead and we're going to create a new slide. I'm just gonna take this video out. I'm gonna look at the slide before it. So this video, if you notice, ended at 342. So for this one, when I bring in the video, that's where I want to start. So insert video. Okay. And do select. And once you bring it in, you see under playback options, you have a play. You can go ahead and start playing it from the beginning 
or you can drag it over. And as you drag, you can see the second counter go along. And I want to come to 342. Okay. And then under where it says start at, there's an option for use current time. I'm going to select that. And then I'm going to press play and play a little farther along since I don't know where I want it to end. What's that? One shiny wet nose, two big furry ears, two big goggly eyes. It's a <laughs> bear. Quick. All right. Stopping point. Wake up. He scares me a little bit. Or it's easier for me just to use current time. And when you come to play it now and present. What's that? You'll notice that that's where the video is going to start. <laughs> I will say, and Sandy, just real quick, I'm just going to jump in. If you notice in this video tutorial, I kind of flub up at the beginning when I'm searching for the for the video. I type it in wrong. In a couple of our other videos, we made little minor mistakes, and no one has time to continually remake their instructional videos, right? So I, I'm one of those who thinks that um, it's nice to model for students when you make a little mistake that you keep going and you're able to recover. So um, we left those little little things in there for you to laugh at, um, whether it's having an eight and a half by 10 inch piece of paper or whatever it is. So, <laughs> All right. So Ellen's admitting to her mistakes. Um, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> animated videos are a wonderful tool for, um, well, of course, speech therapy, but, but any lesson. Um, so we have a list here that we found of animated videos. They're video shorts. Um, in the old days, when we went to the movie theater, we would see them played before a Disney movie, usually. Um, they're cute and fun, and um, you can add pictures to the bottom of them and use it as a um, activity. Uh, we also recommend that you download your video uh, using some kind of website, such as um, this one right here. It allows you to download the video uh, without ads and pop-ups onto your desktop, and then you drag it into your Google Slides and then um, you know insert it into your presentation, and then you can change the start stop sign. Okay, now, what speech path doesn't love games, right? Like they teach you social skills, turn taking, you can get so much language out of them. So it is possible to play some games in Google Slides. And rather than reinvent the wheel, we have collected some games such as Connect Four, Tic Tac Toe, Snakes and Ladders. And then we're going to show you in a second the Slides Mania board game where you can make your own cards, which is a lot of fun. Um, now, there are, um, the way that you roll the dice, you'll see, uh, as, as Ellen had said, you use a YouTube video, which means you have to click to start the roll and click to stop the roll. Um, but I like real dice. And so this really good dice extension is really good. And I have it right up here. So you see, I just click and it um, rolls the dice. And then this one is called dice thrower. So you see, I click. And I like this one because it also turns to a different color. Um, okay, so let's take a look at the Slides Mania bo um, board game that you all have access to. So here we go. You would begin by going to the individual slides and changing the questions or adding a video or whatever you want on the cards. You put your palms on start, they are movable. You can roll the dice by clicking on the um, start button and then click it again to stop. So I move my pawn to one. And then I have to go to present mode, click on the square, and there's my little activity or question. I click the X to go back. Right now I could roll the dice again. So click once to roll it, once to stop it. And then I would go back to edit mode to move my pawn. 
Okay. Um, so I like this, but I am just, I know we're talking Google slide, but I just want to put this out there for the speech path. There is a website called ultimateslp.com. It is $12 a month, but it is so worth it. You don't have to make your, your cards. They're all pre-made. The games are really fun and interactive game boards, um, a fishing game that the kids just love. So I totally recommend ultimateslp.com. All right. I'm going to add that into the chat here. Okay. Thank you. And I do not work for them. <laughs> My disclaimer. Okay. All right, Ellen, we have like 15 minutes. Doing good for time. How's that? Yep. All right. Um, my remote control isn't working great. So um, if I stall out here, help me out. Um, so um, we also want to talk to you a little bit about differentiating for students. It is something we're both passionate about since we're on the assistive technology team. Um, you know, and there are a couple ways you can do that. Um, one is, um, that's okay, you can move on. Okay, can I? Okay. Yeah. One is just by creating your slides. Oh, you don't need to present that. Oh, you can. Um, <laughs> That's good. You can create them and once, and then either start with, um, for example, in this case, I started with level one. The background was the puzzle itself, the outline puzzle. And then I brought in all of the pieces, turned them the right direction, put them on the boat, and then just removed a couple for the students to, to move themselves. Um, so that's where I started. And then I duplicated the slide and you can make a duplicate of a slide just by selecting the slide in the little film strip on the side and then right clicking and, and choosing, um, I forget if it's duplicate or copy, but you could make one there. Um, and then um, for the second level, I left all of the shapes in the same order, but moved them all over for the student to be able to um, complete the puzzle themselves. And then for the most advanced level, I did not rotate the shapes first. So this one is a little harder um, as far as the visual motor component and that the students have to rotate the shapes themselves and move them into the puzzles. So I've got about 10 puzzles in this one and it ends up being 30 slides, right? 10 for each level, but you make it once and then you just kind of move the pieces around a little bit in a duplicate copy. Um, so that's one way you can differentiate. Um, another way, of course, is to make different levels that have a, um, either um, you've simplified the vocabulary or you've added the symbol support to them, um, added more audio direction. So there's different ways that you can do that. But if you look at this, this particular slide is um, the menu at the beginning of the activity. So when a student comes in either by themselves or with adult support, they would choose the level, which is underlined, and it would go to that group of slides. So Sandy, do you want to move on here? Yes. And Ellen, do we just have two minutes left? 1038? Yeah, so 10.50. Okay, good. Go yep. ahead. This is my favorite one right here. Yeah. So. Um, I'm going to show you how to to link slides in this video. This is the virtual calming room, and um, I um, was able to watch a webinar by Paula Kluth, who does a lot of support um, trainings on universal design for learning and autism. And this is one of her ideas that I then moved into um, Google Slides, um, and I just love how clean it is. Um, so let's take a look at that video. If you created the choice board or virtual classroom or question and answer slides, you're probably going to want to link from one side to another. This is a good example of that. So in this case, I have my virtual calming room where I have a choice board page and each one of these is going to link to a slide full of video choices. So how do we set this up? You can select your text and then add a link or in this case, I want to show you how to add an invisible button um, to give your students a larger target area. So I'm gonna to go to shapes and I'm just gonna add a rectangle and I'm gonna draw a big rectangle around not only the frame, but the text as well. So it doesn't matter what the student taps or selects with their mouse. Get your big shape here and then go to insert and link. And where you would usually paste a web link, you have this option down below that says slides in this presentation. Click that little drop down arrow, search for the slide you want, and then apply it. 
last thing you need to do to make this invisible is go to the paint bucket, transparent, line tool, transparent as well. And it's disappeared. But when we go to present, as I move my mouse over here, you see it changes to the hand with the pointy finger. And then you can click and it will take you to the slide that you linked. Notice at the bottom, I also have a little arrow here that will link back to the choice board and that was set up the same way. All right. If you created a choice board or there we go. Um, so um, choice boards, um, obviously we all love them, um, but some of our students don't have the same access to synchronous learning um, as others, either because of, you know, limitations to their technology or just the amount of support they have. Um, so sometimes you want to be able to present something a little bit simpler. Um, so I love this little template. All it is, is it's a template of nine slides and they've been resized into a square. Um, and um, to make it into a choice board, you're going to fill each of the slides with one of your choices um, and then go to print settings um, or preview. And um, one of your options is um, next to the one slide without notes, click on that little down arrow and change it to handout nine slides per page and select download PDF. And it'll look something like this. So this one just has um, a bunch of ABC games in it. Um, the center I left with directions, but any of these are now active links. So um, if you share the PDF through Seesaw or Classroom or even email with the parents, um, the students can click on the links um, and open them. And I believe for each of these, I also just made, um, just like the last one um, in the calming room, I made a big square, the same size as the whole of the whole slide and made that invisible and linked that out to the game so that um, students wouldn't have to be as precise on where they are um, hitting their target. Um, so that's um, just another choice board option. Okay, Bitmoji. We've heard a rumor that Bitmoji classrooms and side parts and mom jeans are out of style, but you know what? We do not care. We love them. So um, in order to create a Bitmoji classroom, which is basically a Google slide that looks like a classroom, but it has objects that when you link to link, click on them, they link to different things like a video or an activity. Um, the first thing you need to do is create your Bitmoji on your iPhone or your iPad. Um, or your regular phone, and then you download on your computer the Bitmoji extension, and then you can quickly grab a Bitmoji and drag it to your activity. Here's a list of a bunch of templates that you can use. We believe in not reinventing the wheel. I um, love Slides Mania and Ditch That Textbook. Um, Slides Mania comes out with new templates uh, monthly. Uh, Fortune Teller is an example down there that um, I highly recommend. Lots of fun. All right, so for formative assessments, um, we've already shown you a few um, examples. Anytime you've got interactive slides where the students are giving a written or verbal response by recording things or moving things around on the slide, you have an opportunity to informally assess um, their, their knowledge and their um, whether or not they're getting your content. Um, so a couple of other ways are just to create a separate set of Google Slides um, as a quiz presentation, and then you can link it either to your instruction at the end, and I'll show you that here real quick. Um, next slide. Um, so for example, in this one, um, and I won't pop it open because we are coming short on time here, but um, this set of slides will then link to uh, another set that has um, questions built in for the students to drag their responses over into it. Um, another way is to set up a Google form as a quiz. Um, so we've got directions here. Um, one great thing about Google Forms is you can even make your quizzes um, have images as the um, answers. So if you're working with students who are just developing um, some literacy skills, they can make choices by using the images. So um, in the next slide, I've got a lot more information on Google, um, on, um, Google Forms. 
I think Sandy and I are both trying to activate it at the same time. Evaluate knowledge of something. <laughs> there we go. Um, so if you see over on the right side, there's um, uh, some directions as far as how to add images to your Google Forms quizzes, how to create them, and then how to link your form um, um, back to Google Slides. So another great tool is um, Pear Deck. Um, if you haven't tried the Pear Deck um, add-on, it's awesome. It has some templates built in that makes it much easier for you um, that, that go into um, activities for checking with, in with students um, before, during, and after instruction. So um, it's a pretty um, cool little tool. All right, and I just want to share this website. I love this website for virtual math manipulatives. Um, I'm getting better at saying that word, Sandy. Um, so you can get to it from the website and play the play the games and interact with the manipulatives um, or from, from the Chrome or Apple um, apps. Um, and it's a great thing to link to from your slides um, to use. Um, you can even, um, they've now got a way for teachers to model the problems um, to test for um, understanding and link back to their slides. Um, so it is a pretty cool little tool. Um, sharing slides, we talked about um, sharing slides as copies and you used to have to go up to the URL and edit it yourself. And if your um, IT um, are reluctant to add extensions, um, you may still need to. And we've got a video on how to do that in that um, video handout. Um, but the third sort of links a lot extension makes it um, pretty simple and um, it gives you four options. One is to automatically force people to make a copy and it'll set up the link that way for you. One is to set it up as a template and um, another one is in preview mode. Um, so check that um, out as well. I love not having to edit the URLs myself, right Sandy? Yes, I totally agree. Okay. Um, a lot of times as a speech path, we want to share our iPad screen, um, mainly so that we can model on a, the student's communication device, right? We just use their file on our iPad and then we can share it. Now, within Zoom, you can use AirPlay. However, we have found it to be pretty glitchy. Um, so what we recommend is this app that you download onto your computer called Reflector 3. It's $18. Once you download it, you have it forever. Um, if your admin says why, well, right here where it says AirPlay versus Reflector 3, there's a list of pros and cons to both. The other main thing is that I can have both activities appear at the same time. Time, um, the, the iPad and the Google Slide activity. Um, this Who's It activity by Google uh, Slide Mania is awesome. And Bethany, thank you for reminding us that um, Slide Mania will um, create things for you if you give them suggestions. Okay, just a friendly <laughs> reminder to um, be uh, uh, mindful of what pictures you're using. And um, here's a list of some, some places where you can find some that are royalty free and fair use and also um, using Creative Commons license pictures in Google search. Here is a list of Google Slides and add-ons that we like the best. They're pretty self-explanatory. And the only one we didn't talk about was Slide Translator. And if you've got students that are using voice typing um, as a writing accommodation, it allows them to type um, with their voice directly into the slide instead of having to do it into the speaker notes and then copy and paste it. Yeah, and Ellen, I have a quick question. When they um, open our um, slides that we've included as, as activities, do they have to make a copy right away? No, they're, they're um, set up in view mode. So um, please don't ask for, <laughs> for permission. Just go up to file and um, make a copy of the presentation and then you can edit your own copy. Okay. All right, so so file, make a copy, and then they'll have their own copy. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, um, so That's we it. did it. High five, Ellen. We we did it in the time frame. One minute to spare. <laughs> One minute to spare. There's our email address if you guys have any questions. Um, and uh, feel free to ask.